Hi food eaters, this is Mel Weinstein, host of the Food Labels Revealed podcast and the self-professed prophet of processed foods. Welcome to the 12th episode. For this show, I'm turning my attention to America's all-time favorite food, pizza. But since I like to check out processed foods, I'll be looking at two of the Myriad frozen pizzas available in most mainstream grocery stores. I'm going to be comparing Red Baron's Classic Crust Supreme Pizza against its natural meatless and organic counterpart, Amy's Italian Sausage, Mushroom, and Olive Pizza. How do their ingredients compare? Which is healthier? Which costs the most? And which one should you subject your body to? Along the way, You'll learn some interesting things about those two companies, a little food history, as well as get exposed to a few new food ingredients. But before getting to all that, here's an FLR commercial, the only one you'll ever hear. I don't make money doing this. The program is 100% free with no strings attached. In fact, the podcast is a net negative enterprise. I don't accept any sponsorship, so I am able to keep the show real and untainted by outside influences. All I ever include is a commercial, like this one, for the podcast. If you get tired of listening to the commercial, show after show, just fast forward through this section. That's what I would do. For those new to the podcast, here's a bit about myself. I have a 30 plus year background in chemistry education food testing, and chemical research. And, for many years, I've had a fascination with what we eat, what makes up what we eat, and what processed foods might be doing to our health. Based upon my work experience in the food ingredient industry, I also bring some inside information to this subject. This is the only podcast that I know of that is dedicated to revealing the information behind the names of all those strange and unusual ingredients found in processed foods. If you are so inclined, drop me a note with questions or comments at this email address, foodlabelsrevealed at gmail.com. That's all one string, foodlabelsrevealed at gmail.com. Also, if you could leave a review, good or bad, at the iTunes store, I would greatly appreciate it. The last time I checked, there were zero reviews. Ouch. My hosting website is Podbean, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N, and all the episodes can be obtained at the website, which is www.podbean.com, or by searching online for the title, Food Labels Revealed. And, of course, you can listen to the podcast on your smartphone or tablet by installing any of the typical apps like Apple's Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and other lesser-known apps. One final announcement. I used to create a parallel video podcast for YouTube, but it was immensely unpopular, so I stopped doing it. But the first 10 episodes are still on YouTube, so if you would like to listen to those episodes with a slideshow format, head on over to YouTube and search on Food Labels Revealed. I try to read a number of books each year on the subject of processed foods. It helps me keep up to date and educated about the ever-changing world of food ingredients. Right now, I'm reading the book called Swallow This, Serving Up the Food Industry's Darkest Secrets by Joanna Blythman, a, notice, <laughs> a noted British investigative journalist who researches food. Here's what the inside flap of the book says. Quote, don't trust those upbeat claims you see on food packaging. Behind the clamor of clean labels emblazoned with reassuring tick lists and additive-free claims stand companies that exploit the creed of commercial confidentiality to stop us knowing how our food is made. Paramount goal of the modern food processing industry isn't giving us healthy, life-sustaining food, but manufacturing lucrative products at the lowest possible production cost, using every trick in the book. It is aided and abetted in this mission by powerful supermarkets that have more to gain from selling us complex, multi-ingredient products than honest-to-goodness whole foods. 
The processed food industry, which is closely aligned to the global chemical industry, takes full advantage of weak regulation, driven by brinkmanship and a cavalier, safe until proven dangerous attitude. It foists on us new, inadequately tested technologies that compromise the integrity of natural foods without stopping the question what this might be doing to our health. End quote. This lady is like a superheroine to me. She really smacks the processed food industry around. Kabam! Pow! She doesn't hold anything back, as you can tell from the book excerpt that I, that I just read. The only problem with the writing is the occasional reference to peculiar British foods and ingredients, which I know nothing about. But that's a minor point. There is much good material in Swallow This, and I'm sure that I'll be frequently referring to her book in later episodes. Now on to the subject at hand, frozen pizza. Let's start with a little history. This information comes from a kid's website called wonderopolis.org. We owe frozen pizza, good or bad, to a man by the name of Clarence Bird's Eye. Yes, you've probably heard of him, the founder of the Bird's Eye Company, known for its frozen vegetables. In 1923, mimicking techniques for rapidly freezing food developed by the native peoples of the Arctic, Clarence Birdseye invested $7 in an electric fan, buckets of salt water, and lots of ice, and developed a method for flash freezing vegetables, fruits, and meats without altering their taste. The frozen food industry was born. Frozen pizzas didn't come along until much later, in the 1950s. The best-known early manufacturer was Totino, based on the pizza invented by Rose and Jim Totino in Minneapolis. I remember eating those frozen pizzas as a kid. They were cheap and lousy, but so easy to make. If my memory is working right, I recall that grocery stores sold single-serve Totino pizzas 10 for a dollar. You could feed crappy pizza to a family of six back then for only a dollar. They tasted nasty, the cheese was gummy, and the tomato sauce was sparse. The wonders of food technology. Frozen pizzas did get better over the years, thanks to some smart and creative food scientists. So today, there are a few frozen pizzas that some people claim rival freshly made pizza in restaurants. Well, I took a trip to my local grocery store to see what was available. One bank of frozen food cases stretched almost the whole width of the store, and about two-thirds of those cases were stocked with frozen pizzas and related pizza items. There were 19 different manufacturers represented, and each had several to a half a dozen varieties. So there may have been up to a hundred choices available to consumers. That's an incredible selection. Here are some of the brands that I saw. Butch's, California Pizza Kitchen, Roadhouse, Bon Appetit, DiGiorno, Newman's Own, Screaming Sicilian, Home Run Inn, Fruschetta, Red Baron, Tombstone, Jack's, and Totino's. Yes, Totino's is still hanging in there. Frozen pizza must be very popular. Some online stats mention that we spend, meaning Americans, an annual $37 billion on frozen pizza, one-third of the global market. The average American family eats pizza at home 30 times a year, about once every two weeks, and we eat 3 billion pizzas each year. I chose two frozen pizzas to evaluate and compare. First, Red Baron Classic Crust Supreme Pizza and Amy's Italian Sausage, Mushroom, and Olive Pizza. The first one was found in the main frozen food section, while the second one was located in the natural food section. Let's begin with the Red Baron Pizza. The brand, Red Baron, is owned by the Schwann Food Company. You may be familiar with the yellow Schwann trucks that deliver frozen foods in city neighborhoods. Actually, Schwann is a multi-billion dollar company with an excess of 12,000 employees and a variety of brands, including several other pizza lines like Fruschetta and Tony's. The company was started by Marvin Schwann in 1952. 
with the delivery of homemade ice cream manufactured by his parents. In the 1970s, the company started selling frozen pizza under the Red Baron name to grocery stores. The Red Baron Squadron, composed of vintage biplanes, was introduced in 1979 to promote the brand nationwide. If you look at a box of Red Baron pizza, you'll see a serious-looking pilot with a red scarf and airplane goggles reminiscent of a World War I flying ace. Here is what the company has to say about Red Baron Pizza at their website. Quote, If you're getting a supreme crust, why not load it with supreme ingredients? Sausage, pepperoni, and green and red peppers raise this pizza to absolute pizza supremacy. Not too thick, not too thin, and loaded with awesomeness. We believe a better crust makes a better pizza. That's why our pizzas start with the perfect crust, one that has a satisfying texture and bakes to a delicious golden brown. We top it with a robust sauce containing the right medley of herbs and spices. What about cheese, you ask? It's real cheese deliciousness. From the first bite to the last, it's pizza nirvana. There's a a reason Red Baron Pizza is trusted in 26 million homes across the country. So open the freezer and pull out a Red Baron Pizza right now. The faster you start, the sooner you'll get to enjoy that first bite of pizza perfection. End quote. In my grocery store, that uh, Red Baron Pizza costs $2.99 for a one and a half pound package. Pretty darn cheap. That could easily feed two people for about $1.50 each. So, here is the ingredient list. Enriched flour, made from wheat flour and malted barley flour. And then there's vitamins and minerals, niacin, reduced iron, thiamine mononitrate, riboflavin, folic acid. And then there's water, low moisture part skim mozzarella cheese, composed of cultured pastured part skim milk, salt, and enzymes. Then there's uh, the cooked pizza topping, uh, which has sausage, that has pork, mechanically separated chicken, spices, water, salt, sugar, garlic powder, water, texturized vegetable protein, which is made from soy flour, and salt. Then there's green and red peppers, tomato paste, pepperoni, which is made from pork, mechanically separated chicken, beef, salt, and contains less than 2% or 2% or less, I should say, of water, dextrose, spices, smoke flavoring, lactic acid, starter culture, sodium ascorbate, flavoring, garlic powder, sodium nitrite, BHA, BHT, citric acid, and contains one or more of either paprika or oleo resin of paprika, onion, contains 2% or less of yeast, palm oil, sugar, vegetable oil, can be soybean and or canola oil, salt, modified cornstarch, spice, maltodextrin, dried garlic, hydrolyzed soy, and corn protein, paprika, dried onion, wheat starch, L-cysteine hydrochloride, ammonium sulfate, soy lecithin, natural flavor, enzymes, and absorbic acid. If the water and vitamins are not counted, uh, there are a total of 54 ingredients. Yowzer! Now, some of those ingredients are there more than once, like salt which shows up four times. If you ignore the replicates, then the total drops down to 41 unique ingredients. That's still a whopping number. It's interesting to note that the generic word spices appears three times, even though some spices like garlic and paprika are named specifically. There's no requirement for a food company to disclose the identity of certain ingredients like spices. That's proprietary information, and leaving it off labels protects the company's recipe. The same thing applies to the words artificial flavor, natural flavor, and coloring. Manufacturers are usually tight-lipped about those components. 
Getting back to the label, do you really need 50 ingredients to make a supreme pizza? Well, I looked online and found a decent looking homemade supreme pizza recipe at pickypalette.com. And it includes directions for making your own crust. The total number of ingredients, not counting water, 15. And that includes one commercial cheese mozzarella and a commercial tomato sauce. Now, of course, the cheese and tomato sauce have their own ingredients, but if you estimate that there may be another, say, eight ingredients in the mix, then the total comes out to about 23 in the homemade pizza. Compare that number to 50 in the Red Baron. Why does the Red Baron have so many extra ingredients, namely 27 other ingredients? It's the difference between you preparing a pizza in your own kitchen versus a pizza being built in a factory. The factory pizza needs flavorings, improvers, anti-caking agents, preservatives, colorings, acids, emulsifiers, releasing agents, antioxidants, thickeners, bleaching agents, sweeteners, chelators, and other chemicals to allow for rapid manufacturing and stability as it goes from the factory floor to the grocery store case, and then through a long shelf life waiting for you to buy it. We'll see some of these chemicals as I wade through the ingredient list. I'm not going to talk about the simple well-known ingredients like salt, sugar, spices, yeast, and vegetables. And I'm not going to talk about the mozzarella cheese, which has standard ingredients like milk, salt, and enzymes for curdling. However, I will keep the number sequential so you know where the ingredient shows up on the label. Let's start with the crust, which is composed of enriched flour made from two ingredients. Number one, wheat flour. There's not much information here about the wheat flour used in this pizza. Since we don't see the word bleached on the label, it's a bit confusing whether the flour has been bleached or not. I don't think the food manufacturer has to say that on the label. Since there's no info here, let's assume the flour is unbleached, so I won't have to say anything about the bleaching process. Now, it's obvious that Schwann is not using whole wheat flour in their pizza, since we see the word enriched on the label. Enriched means that nutrients, in this case vitamins and minerals, have been restored to the flour after they were stripped out in the processing of the flour. That is the germ, the oily part, and the bran, the fiber part, which had the nutrients, were removed from the wheat before making the flour. Now, did the flour company add back in vitamins and minerals out of the goodness of their heart to help with our health? No. Our government, through the directives of the FDA, require minimal amounts of thymine, which is B1, riboflavin B2, niacin B3, folic acid, and iron to be added to refined flour. By using enriched flour, Schwann saves money, can use a dough that's easier to work with, and is more shelf-stable. A win-win-win for them, but a big loss as far as nutrition goes for us food eaters. The number two ingredient that's part of the enriched flour is malted barley flour. It's probably there to provide enzymes to help condition the dough, and it doesn't add any flavor or color. Malted barley flour is also just called malt. The FDA allows up to 0.75% barley flour to be in the enriched flour. Just an inside. Enriched flour is an example of a standard of identity, which is a food definition mandated by the federal government, which specifies what manufacturers of that food have to do when making and processing their product. It assures customers that they are getting a consistent food ingredient whenever they see it listed on the label. I'm going next to the cooked pizza toppings, the, the first of which is the sausage. There are nine ingredients in the sausage. Here are two of them. Number seven is mechanically separated chicken. Yes, there's chicken in the sausage. I would guess because chicken is cheaper than pork. We'll see why that's a good guess in a, in a minute. Now, this ingredient is not plain old chicken. It's mechanically separated chicken. According to Wikipedia, it's produced by forcing pureed or ground chicken meat under high pressure through a sieve or similar device to separate the bone from the edible meat tissue. Yes, you heard right. I said bone. 
That produces a puree or paste-like meat product, which is sometimes called white slime. The number 10 ingredient is sugar. Okay, you got to have sugar in your sausage, right? But maybe it's in there for bulking and, and not sweetness. Now, also in this sausage, uh, which is covered by number 12 and number 13, is texturized vegetable protein composed of soy flour and salt. So, you know, here, here's something else that's part of the, the meat topping, but, but wait a second. That's not meat. Schwann slipped some faux meat onto their pizza. Why would they do such a thing? Come on, you know, it's cheaper than meat and will fool lots of folks. TVP is pretty nasty stuff. I used to eat it before I knew how it was made. First, the oil from soybeans is extracted or removed using hexane, a gasoline-like solvent. The leftover material is called defatted soy flour. After the residual hexane is removed, the soy flour is mixed with water to make a stiff dough-like substance. That material is mechanically forced under pressure through a metal die. That process is called extrusion. As the soy leaves the extruder, it becomes a spongy, meat-like material. That is, it has been texturized. It's then dried, making it a durable and <coughs> shelf-stable food product. After all said and done, the TV t TVP is a very distant cousin of the soybean. Number 17 through number 19 is the pepperoni uh, composed of pork, chicken, and beef. More meat shows up after the vegetables on the label. So there's, you know, more vegetables and there is pepperoni. But note that both the chicken and beef are mechanically separated meats, a very cheap source, plus there's less pepperoni than the, and then the TVP that's on the pizza. Number 26 is flavoring. Like the spices on the label, Schwann gives us the generic word flavoring, which once more tells us nothing about the ingredients that are added for flavor, not even whether they are artificial or natural. However, natural flavor does show up as ingredient number two way down on the ingredient list. The subject of flavoring or flavors used by the processed food industry can be a whole book in and of itself. There are thousands of flavor additives available to food manufacturers. The subject is mind-boggling, but too immense to go into in this podcast. Maybe a whole episode will be devoted to that subject in the future. Just keep this in mind. Flavorings are used and necessary because the processing of foods used in products like frozen pizza strips the foods of their natural flavors. So, like vitamins and minerals, the food product has to be enriched with flavorings so they don't taste like the boxes or plastic that they come in. Number 28 ingredient is sodium nitrite. This is a pretty nasty chemical. It was the ingredient of the day in episode number 9, which was on bologna sandwiches. Sodium nitrite helps keep the meat looking reddish or pinkish, which people prefer as opposed to brownish or grayish. Also, it serves as a preservative against the formation of the botulism bacteria frequently involved in food poisoning. It's one of the few additives known to have directly caused deaths in the United States. Also, nitrites, after consumption, can produce cancer-causing agents called nitrosamines. Number 29 and number 30 are BHA and BHT. These are two more preservatives or antioxidants. BHT, or butylated hydroxytoluene, was talked about in episode number one. BHA stands for butylated hydroxyanisole. Both these preservatives suck up oxygen, which could cause the fatty components of the pizza to go rancid. You know, making a, you know, creating some off flavors. Notice that food manufacturers prefer to use the acronyms for these preservatives on the labels rather than the chemical names, since those could scare some people off. BHA is a suspected carcinogen, and for that reason, many food companies have stopped putting it in their products. Number 40 is modified food starch. As stated in earlier episodes, this is one of the most common unknown ingredients in the processed food industry. It shows up everywhere. 
It's actually a generic term that could represent one or more of dozens of chemical derivatives of a food starch, like corn starch or wheat starch or others. The Schwann Company doesn't even want to reveal what plant the base starch came from. So people who have food allergies can't spot the allergen allergens on the food label. Go figure. If you want some detail about modified food starches, I'll refer you to episode number one, where I go into some detail about those additives. Number 44 and number 45 are hydrolyzed soy and corn protein. This is just another way of saying soy sauce. If you're sensitive to MSG, then you should avoid any foods with soy sauce in them. Number 49 is L-cysteine hydrochloride. Cysteine is an amino acid usually obtained from bird feathers, human hair, or hog's hair. Most production occurs in China. Its purpose as an additive is to condition dough to make it more manageable. There are some synthetic and microbial sources of cysteine, but they are more expensive and only account for about 10% of the total market share. Number 50 is ammonium sulfate. This chemical is also used as a dough conditioner and as a strengthener and is common in the baking industry. Number 51, soy lecithin. One of the 10 most used additives in the food industry, its purpose is to improve the ability of the dough to rise. It's an industrial material chemically isolated from soybeans. Number 54, the last one is ascorbic acid. This is the chemical that most people call vitamin C. You may think that it's wonderful that Schwann throws an extra vitamin into their pizza, but in reality, the ascorbic acid is just another preservative, the fourth one on the list. Well, that takes care of Red Baron frozen pizza. Let's move on to its high-end competitor, Amy's Pizza Italian Sausage Mushroom and Olive Meatless Pizza. In my grocery store, it costs $5.99 for a 0.94 pound package. Amy's aims for customers who are health conscious and interested in vegetarian products. Their food ingredients are organic, so their customers don't have to be concerned about chemical pesticide and herbicide residues in the food. Amy's is a company that started in a home kitchen in 1987 with one product and has grown tremendously in the last 20 years, now offering dozens of organic products. The owners are Andy and Rachel Berliner, Berliner who named their company after their first daughter. And this is, uh, this is from their website, quote, the Berliners have always believed that people have a right to know what they put in their bodies. So when they learned about GMOs, they put a strict policy in place to be sure that none of their dishes contained GMO ingredients. In 2001, Amy's Kitchen began using the non-GMO label on their packaging. Also from the website, quote, our pizza toppings are placed by hand and our cheese is sprinkled by hand. And they say about their pizza, quote, a perfect blend of authentic Italian spices is the key to our savory meatless Italian sausage, along with organic mushrooms, tender olives, and a sprinkle of green onions over our house-made sauce and mozzarella. It all adds up to one great tasting pizza, end quote. So here are the ingredients in the Amy's pizza. Organic unbleached wheat flour, filtered water, organic tomato puree, part skim mozzarella and parmesan cheeses made from pasteurized part skim milk, culture salt, and enzymes, olives, fontina cheese made from pasteurized milk, culture salt, and enzymes, organic extra virgin olive oil, organic onions, organic mushrooms, organic honey, organic tofu made from water and organic soybeans and magnesium chloride then there's sea salt organic long grain red rice organic garlic organic quinoa expeller pressed high oleic safflower and or sunflower oil organic green lentils wheat gluten organic bell peppers spices organic flaxseed yeast black pepper organic agave syrup and finally, natural hickory smoke flavor. 
There are a total of 32 ingredients, not counting the water. After subtracting out replicates, the total comes to 28 unique ingredients. Did you notice that Amy's does not use enriched flour, so they don't need to add back in vitamins and minerals? Since most of the ingredients are real foods, the only food additives that show up in this ingredient list are magnesium chloride and wheat gluten. The only processed ingredients are agave syrup, natural hickory smoke flavor, and spices. Everything else, except the cheese and the oils, are whole food ingredients. So I'll just deal with those five additives and processed materials. <clears throat> Number 17 is magnesium chloride. This chemical is used to curdle the soy milk to make the tofu, the source of the meat-free sausage. It is considered safe. Number 25 is wheat gluten. And wheat gluten is that portion of the flour that's left after the starchy component is removed. Wheat gluten is very high in protein. It gives structure to baked goods. Gluten is the sticky, stretchy material that forms when wheat flour and water are mixed. Gluten increases the dough's ability to rise. It also increases the bread's structural stability and chewiness. Number 27 is spices. Surprisingly, Amy's keeps their spice cards close to their chest, just like Schwann's did. They're not telling us anything. Number 31, agave syrup. This sweet, thick liquid is derived from a cactus-like South American plant and is one and a half times sweeter than table sugar. Depending upon the manufacturer, it can be very lightly refined or heavily refined. For the light variety, the agave nectar is extracted from the plant at low temperatures or using enzymes. This ingredient sits at the end of the ingredient list on the label following black pepper, so there's just a wee bit of it in the pizza. It may be there just for flavoring, but I'm not sure. It certainly is not present for sweetness since it comes way after honey, which is the 15th ingredient. Number 32 is natural hickory smoke flavor. I, I have to admit that this stuff is one of my favorite flavors because it smells great, and adds such a pungent taste to foods, but it may not be all that healthy. Fortunately, it's the very last ingredient in the list, so it's present at very, very low levels. Okay, that's it for Amy's Pizza. So let's now compare the two pizzas. I'll be examining the following factors. Number one, cost. Number two, nutrition. And number three, health. I won't be comparing the taste, which I know is paramount to many people, but I can't be objective in that, in that kind of evaluation. First, the cost. Which pizza is the better buy, irrespective of anything else? The Red Baron pizza costs 299 cents for 664 grams. Dividing those two figures gives 0.45 cents per gram. The Amy's pizza costs 599 cents for 2425 grams. Dividing those numbers gives 1.41 cents per gram. Now, dividing 1.41 cents by the 0.45 cents gives 3.1. So that means that Amy's Pizza, gram for gram, is 3.1 times more expensive than the Red Baron Pizza. Red Baron wins hands down in the cost category. Second, uh, let's evaluate nutrition. For this comparison, I'll be looking at the serving size, which is one-fifth of the pizza, which is similar in both pizzas. Looking at calories, the Red Baron has 320 versus 330 calories for the Amy's. Pretty similar. For total fat, the Red Baron has 15 grams versus 14 grams for Amy's. Again, that's pretty similar. For saturated fat, the Red Baron has 7 grams versus 4.5 grams for Amy's. There is a significant difference here. If you ate four servings of the Red Baron pizza, you would exceed the recommended daily amount for saturated fat. But four servings of the Amy's pizza wouldn't trigger alarms. For cholesterol, the Red Baron has 30 milligrams versus 15 milligrams for the Amy's. Amy's pizza wins in that category. For sodium, Red Baron has 690 milligrams versus 710 milligrams for Amy's. These are close numbers. In either case, if the whole pizza was eaten, the maximum daily limit for sodium would be exceeded in just one meal. 
so both pizzas are loaded with salt. For dietary fiber, the Red Baron has 2 grams versus 2 grams for Amy's, a dead heat. For sugar, Red Baron has 7 grams versus 3 grams for Amy's. The Red Baron is, is a significantly sweeter pizza. As far as nutrition goes, the two pizzas line up pretty similarly, but the Amy, Amy's wins overall with lower saturated fat, cholesterol, and sugar. All right, third category to look at is health. I judge this category based on the quality of the ingredients and the amount of processed ingredients in the pizza. Looking at the Red Baron pizza, there are 23 processed ingredients and additives together. Out of the 41 unique ingredients in the Red Baron pizza, 56% of the pizza ingredients are highly processed. Looking at the Amy's pizza, there are 7 processed ingredients and additives together. Out of the 28 unique ingredients in the Amy's pizza, 25% of the pizza can be considered highly processed. So compare 56% for Red Baron versus 25% for Amy's. Hands down, Amy's is the healthier pizza. Also, not to be overlooked, all the toppings and the flour in the Amy's pizza are organic, giving it a substantial health edge over the Red Baron pizza, which has nothing organic in it. So, in summary, here's the final analysis. If in selecting a frozen pizza, all you cared about was cost, and were unconcerned about nutrition and health, the Red Baron pizza would win out. You could stuff yourself very cheaply and at the same time be consuming a massive amount of highly processed food ingredients and industrial food additives, including four preservatives. But if you cared more about the quality of the ingredients or health effects on your body and the lack of chemical preservatives, then Amy's would be your best selection. Again, I'm not considering taste here. So even though the Amy's pizza is hands down the healthiest choice, some people would never buy it. One, because it's meatless, and two, maybe the taste might not be satisfying. So, food eaters, what are your thoughts? Did this analysis of frozen pizza change your opinion about it? Please share your thoughts by emailing me at foodlabelsrevealed at gmail.com. Until the next episode, take care, and if you want to eat well, and keep yourself healthy, eat food mainly from natural plants, not manufacturing plants.